Welcome to the Q Podcast. Q is about conversation. If we're really concerned about ending poverty, we've got to be more concerned about creating justice. Our cultural products as Christians need to both defy and resonate with the culture. God's doing amazing things. His church is expanding. His church is growing. It's not what's the purpose of my life. It's what is the purpose that's been assigned. Stay curious. Think well. Advance good. This is Q. Welcome to the Q Podcast. I'm Gabe Lyons. I'm so glad you're joining us for a conversation today that's really coming around this idea of what does it mean to be single? Or for those who just aren't married or maybe never will be married, what does it mean for us as the church, for those of us who are Christian brothers and sisters, to come around those who maybe aren't ever going to be married or maybe don't even desire to be married? What does it mean for us to not just assume that's their future, but to come alongside as friends and to invest and create family that looks much different and maybe much bigger than what many have ever imagined? So today we're going to get to hear a talk from Annie F. Downs, and Annie is a good friend. She's someone who has written so many books. She has an incredible style of lots of humor and fun, but also making things incredibly practical. And she spoke at one of our previous events called Q Women where we asked her to give a talk that would just help people understand what is life like for you, like in the church, as a person who's out leading, who's out speaking, but you, by definition, when you have to check off sort of the profile sheet of are you married or single, check single. And it's not that Annie would say she's not desiring to be married, but she's saying, look, I'm, I'm somebody who's a little past, you know, the college age, I'm, I'm sort of living into adulthood, and now, you know, I have to wrestle with this fact that I'm not married and I don't know if I will be married. And so what does it mean to engage that? Now, this is particularly important right now and incredibly relevant because for the first time in American history, when you look at adults over age 18, we have more single adults than we do married. And so it's absolutely shifting the landscape of our culture. It's, it's shifting the landscape of how people socialize. It's changing the way friendships operate. It's changing the entire dating game where technology and apps like Tinder and so many other new apps are coming online to try to help people find connection. We have things like eHarmony who are designed specifically to match up people who have similar profiles and who look to be compatible from a scientific perspective. And yet what Annie reminds us of today, and it's so compelling to hear it from her, is that it's not all about that ultimate relationship. That ultimately, you have to understand that God's going to meet you right where you're at and that He's enough and that we don't necessarily have to have a husband. We don't have to have these things that in our minds might seem like they could fulfill us. And yet we know deep down it never actually fills that void that's deep inside of us. Now, Annie's written a couple of books lately. Her, her newest one, Looking for Lovely, is fabulous. It's fun. It's something that um, my daughter has read, my wife has read. I've read some of it, not the entire thing, and it's, it's really engaging. But she also wrote a book called Let's All Be Brave, which holds a special place in my heart because my daughter read that, and it was in reading this book about being brave that she actually decided to commit her life to Christ. And it's an amazing story of how Annie has deeply influenced even our own family. So I just want you to sit back. I want you to just listen to Annie. You're going to laugh. You're going to enjoy this. But let's think deeply about what does it mean for us as Christian brothers and sisters to come around those in our life who aren't married and maybe never will be married. This is my comforter. Um, it is, I wanted to introduce you to my comforter. This isn't going to be some analogy about the Holy Spirit, I promise. This is literally the comforter off of my bed. Um, I brought it with me. I folded it up on a Monday morning and brought it along with me to speak at Q Women. And I've never done that before. I don't know how your Mondays usually go, but I don't ever take my comforter with me anywhere. So that was weird. And I still, because I'm a Yahoo, I still totally made my bed. Like, I put the pillows up, I put the other blanket on, um, and I looked in the mirror and said, you're so weird. <laughs> you like, made your bed without your comforter, but alas, I did. Um, in 2005, I was 25 years old. I was teaching elementary school outside of Atlanta in Marietta, Georgia, and I just bought a cute little, like, cookie-cutter house for my best friend and her husband. Um, this is for free. Uh, probably don't buy houses from friends. It's, like, not the most convenient 
and healthy thing for a friendship when you're trying to talk numbers like that. So I probably won't do that again. But the house was really cute, so it was worth it. Um, And I went shopping and, you know, spent a couple of weeks kind of building and putting together this house. I was 25, young, single, excited, and I, it was my first house, and, and it was a great house, and in my head, it was kind of like, this is the house I'll be in, you know, when I get married. This will be the house. It's so cute. It's perfect, whatever, and so I put all the different rooms together, used some furniture from my parents' house, because that's what 25-year-olds do, uh, no offense, and uh, used some furniture that I had inherited, and kind of, you know, filled up my little house. And it got to the place where it was time to buy the comforter, where that was really all that was left to make my house complete. The comforter that I wanted is this one from Pottery Barn that is like real, like down, full of feathery things. And it has like push places in it, like picks and buttons. And uh, it's really soft and really white. The day came when I was ready to buy it and I was tired of waiting, which is kind of like the subtitle to my life. And I took a friend with me. We went to a really nice establishment called Walmart to um, get a new comforter. And this is the one we bought. And the idea behind this comforter was, I mean, it'll do until I get married and get a nice one, right? It'll do, it's fine. It covers, which is what it's supposed to do. It is not white, I actually don't like the color. I have never really liked the weird design on it. Sometimes when I can't fall asleep, I trace it and it's a never ending pattern. It makes me feel like I'm gonna get put in a mental institution. (laughs) And it has a stain on it right here that I wish I could tell you was like from a handmade inkwell, from a farm to table goose quill pen. Uh, but it's chocolate almond milk, which is still like white girl hipster, but not quite as white girl hipster as like ink, right? But it has a stain on it. And yet for nine years, it's been my comforter for nine years. It doesn't even keep me warm. Would you please see how thin it is? I mean, I might as well pile under t-shirts. So in the winter, not only do I have this in a sheet, I have a blanket on top. It doesn't even do its job. I never meant for it to do its job. It was just supposed to be the thing that held me over until I got the thing I really wanted. For 10 years, I've been living in a state of waiting for. I've been waiting for, I've been waiting to buy the new comforter when my dream became reality for 10 years. And the thing, we're friends enough that you can say this to me because it's true. The thing about this dream is the reality is it may never happen. And I could sleep under this comforter for three more decades. And I've always just been waiting for the dream to come true so I can have the thing I really want. When I was 20, I went on a mission trip to Scotland. Has anybody ever been to Scotland? Oh, listen, people. It is, the Lord lives there, I'm convinced. I think the Lord lives there. Um, It is absolutely gorgeous. I remember we got off the plane and drove into Edinburgh and I, I fell in love with the green, all the different shades of green. I fell in love with the way it smelled, the old cobblestone streets up, up in the top of the Royal Mile is the Edinburgh Castle and it's been there for hundreds and hundreds of years and it's just, it's beautiful. I loved everything, everything about that first trip. And I remember saying, I would love to live here someday. I would love to live here. And then in my 20s, I had a couple of opportunities with a mission sending organization or, or to teach over there. These different times that people said, hey, why don't you come live in Scotland? And, and I always said no. And I said no for good reasons. I don't think I missed God's best plan for me. I don't think my life was uh, wasted. But somewhere in like the back, 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 back of my heart, I think I said no to Scotland. Because what if, it, what if saying yes to Scotland meant saying no to getting married? What if I was giving up the dream for a dream? And spoiler alert, there are actually men in Scotland. So it actually would have been fine. And they wear kilts and it's kind of hot. And they have great accents that are definitely hot. So it's not like I was going to a place where I was actually not going to have the opportunity to ever get married. But that is what I heard in my heart. And when I turned 30, I remember even that week maybe, my friend Mary Catherine and I sat on a porch 
in rocking chairs and I said to her, I could go a whole nother decade saying no to Scotland. I could blink and I'll be 40 and I'll have still said no for a decade and may still not have what I'm waiting for. And so in July of 2011, yes, I moved to Scotland. I moved to Edinburgh. And I would get up every morning and leave my flat. I worked for a church. I was on helping them plant a college ministry. My job title was party starter. Thank you very much. <laughs> Who gets paid for that? This guy. It was awesome. I loved it. I would get up from my flat and I would walk through the meadows to the University of Edinburgh. That's not like me being artistic. That's actually the area that it's called between where I lived in Morningside and the University of Edinburgh. It's called the meadows. And I would walk through the meadows and I would get every day I saw Edinburgh Castle. And every day I smelled the city and every day I talked to people and made friends and lived a dream. And I missed nothing. I missed some weddings. But I missed nothing by going toward the dream where the door was open. And you know what is crazy is that I am okay to say to you that I was brave enough to move overseas. I was brave enough to move my life, but I haven't been brave enough to face what it means if I buy a new comforter. I can stand in front of some fears and then some fears I can't. Because to buy a new comforter says, even if God never does what I hope he does, I'll be okay. Even if he never answers my deepest heart's dreams, I'll be great. So what more do you want? Do you want permission to grieve a dream never realized? Because listen, here's the reality. We all can look in our lives and there are dreams that absolutely there is no way they will come to pass. I thought when I graduated from the University of Georgia that I would marry a guy who graduated from the University of Georgia and we would raise tiny bulldog children and we would teach them how to survive weekends like what happened to us last weekend against Florida. We would teach them how, what the, the spiritualness of surviving a loss. I thought I'd spend my 20s in a cute little house raising cute little kids. And that is a dream that will never happen, ever. Unless science does something weird, right? My counselor a couple of months ago said, Annie, I think you need to grieve that. You need to feel that. And I did. I needed it and then I wept it out. Do you need permission to grieve a dream never realized? You can do that. You can grieve a dream never realized. Maybe you need permission to dream new things and to dream other things besides what you have prayed and thought and wanted to be the dream. Are you dreaming of being a mother, but you haven't had a kid? You can mother. I mentor college students here in Nashville, and I mother them. I am not their mother, but I am a mother voice. When 21-year-old guys don't know which button to push on the washing machine, I can tell them these things. <laughs> right? Or when they need to break up with someone and need to talk through how do I do that, I can talk that through with them. I can help my small group girls as they are figuring out what it looks like to transition from college to real adulthood, as I tell them. Because <laughs> they think they've been adults for a long time, right? <laughs> Certainly they have, yes. It's been hard living on your parents' money. <laughs> but you can mother. You don't have to wait to birth a child to mother someone. Right? Like Allie told us already, you can write. You don't need the dream of a book deal or the dream of a massive audience that you've decided is the number you have to have. You can write. That's a dream you can go after. You can minister. Is there a ministry you want to do? Did you not get the job? Or did you have the job and you lost it? Or is the job not in the city where you live? you can still do the ministry that's on your heart, right? So what more do you want? Do you want permission to go after 
the other dreams. Because listen, we think when the door is closed on the dream that all these other little dreams don't matter either. When what if one of those open doors is the dream? What if that takes you to who you are and who you're always meant to be? And, and I also want to give you permission or give you a side doodah. None of this means you have to quit desiring what you want. Be true to your desires. Be honest with what you want. You don't have to run from those. Okay, well, Annie said, if I'm not going to get the thing, I should go after the other thing, so I'm going to pretend like the thing doesn't exist. The thing exists, and it makes your heart beat. But God is bigger, and his dreams for you are bigger. I just don't want to live in this passive state of waiting. I want to live in a chronic state of this is the good life. Right? This is the good life. The word says over and over that God has given you everything you need. Be joyful in hope, right? This is the good life. The, the problem comes, and the problem for me has been when I put all my focus and my hope on the things that I want instead of what I already have and instead of what I can go after. I hope you've enjoyed just hearing Annie's perspective. And we're going to jump right back into the conclusion of this talk. But Annie's just kind of being vulnerable, right? She's, she's helping us understand life through her perspective. And I would say as a married man, somebody who's been married for almost 20 years, it's important for many people who are married to just understand and listen to this, to understand that perhaps somebody will get married, but it's not always the, the way that this goes. I mean, think about Paul. Think about Jesus. These are two of our great heroes of the faith. And yet they weren't married. And so what does it mean for us to actually come alongside in relationship and love people well right where they're at and not just assume that marriage is the ultimate outcome or that it's the ultimate and intimate relationships? I think in the church we've made that mistake too many times and we've set single people up and emphasized singleness to say, hey, of course you're going to get married. Of course that's where you can find deep intimacy and relationship when perhaps it's in intimate friendships that we're going to have those relational needs met. So as we continue on in this, let's continue to listen and try to understand and, and just see how can this learning actually affect the way we start to interact with our own single friends. Welcome to Q, where I give you questions and not answers. So because in our faith, we believe in stories like Abraham and Sarah, where they're 90 years old and they have a baby and it's been their lifelong dream. And the Bible tells us, believe God, believe him for what you want, hope, faith. And then on the other side, we have dreams that buzz by us and never happen. And what do we do where those meet? And what is the address where those meet? I don't know. I think God's there though. I think he meets us in that spot where we believe him so hard and yet we trust him with what he gives. I'm such a pansy. So the question is, how do you craft a life that brings God glory and brings you joy even if he never answers your deepest heart's prayers? How do you craft a life that brings God glory and brings you joy, even if he never answers your deepest prayers. So for me, I get a new comforter, right? I want it to be Monaco blue. And I want it to have ruffles, because I'm the only one who sleeps under it. <laughs> I want it to actually comfort me, <laughs> unlike this piece, <laughs> right? Also for me, I, I keep mothering the next generation. Listen. If I had another 18 minutes, I'd talk about the next generation because they need us. We get to mother them. We get to grandmother them. We get to big sister them. We get to mentor them, male and female. 
And for me, I also have always wanted a bay window seat. The sitch is, I don't have a bay window, so um, it's not a huge deal. I can work around it. We're just, my friend and I are going to build a bench under a window. Because I've always wanted a bay window seat. Right? That's it. I'm doing the things. I'm trying to do the things that bring God glory and bring me joy without ever letting go of the hope that someday he'll answer my heart's deepest prayers. My friend Lindsay is here. Lindsay is sick and is asking God for healing and asking God for healing. And that's the big dream. And yet, meanwhile, she gives other people hope through her bottle of tears company. She gives them hope while she's waiting, right? That's what we do. That's how we craft our life. And I think this is true in every season. Because listen, when this dream of mine passes, when, when it's not just a dream anymore, there'll be something else, right? You're always wanting something else. There's always a dream, a prayer that you've put up that you hope for healing or freedom or something new or something better. And it never goes away. And so we have to keep processing. If God never answers my deepest prayers, what do I do, right? Besides get a new comforter. So the questions I leave you with, what are you waiting for? What's the thing you're waiting for? And what are you asking God for? And what are you begging for? And what are you going to do if it never comes? Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to Annie as much as I did. I think it's a convicting talk to just, you know, not only be encouraged, laugh a little bit, but also challenged, challenged about how we all think about the season of life we're in. It can be so easy, especially in our modern age where it's all about productivity. It's all about what have you done lately? It's all about what can I accomplish or achieve because that gives me status or helps me feel successful or what new relationships can I enter into and talk about and share with others. I think amidst all that pressure that what Annie's saying is, look, settle in to understanding that God wants to use you right now, not tomorrow only or not a year from now or not once you've achieved this certain goal, but right now. I remember talking to a college student recently and he was a graduate student at a, at a Northeastern college, and he'd been dating this girl for five years, and they were in a great friendship relationship and looking for marriage. And he said to me, hey, I just, I'm concerned about getting married right now because I actually um, don't know if we have enough money. I just don't know if I've saved enough. I don't know if we can do it. And he said, what is your advice for me? Because I'm, I'm wondering if I should wait another three years. I looked at him and said, no, you should get married now. Like, don't wait. Don't just assume if I wait, I'll earn enough money and then I can finally have it all. That's an illusion. Like, move forward with your life. Move forward with what's clearly in front of you. So whether it's, in that case, somebody getting married or whether it's somebody like Annie who's single, it's saying, God, what's the next thing you're putting in front of me? And how can I just be faithful in that? On the flip side, for those of you listening who are pastors, elders, leaders in your church, we have a real opportunity right now in this culture to create a moment where we are honoring and respecting and really lifting up the lives of those who are single individuals within our churches and within our communities and encouraging our congregations to not just be so family focused, so nuclear family focused, where everything we're doing in our churches is all about the little kids and all about the nuclear family, and we ignore those who don't have that. And so as I talk to single friends in our own life, one of the things they desire most is just have me over for pizza night. Have me over to watch a movie with your family. Let me hang out. Let me be an aunt or an uncle and just be a part of your family because every one of us needs that kind of closeness, that kind of intimacy. And so it's a challenge to all of us to rethink a deeper theology of singleness. And what does that look like as we go into a future where many more people in American life might be single later into adulthood than we've ever seen as a society? Now, finally, I want to invite you to join us uh, for our Q Conference. So this is called Q 2017. It's April 26th to 28th 
in Nashville, Music City Center, downtown, round tables where people are sitting together in groups of eight, listening to 35 plus talks, engaging every area of culture you can imagine. And just prior to the event, so part of our pre-event on April 26th, there's a three-hour Q Women event. So if you're a woman listening to this, if you're somebody who follows Annie or my wife Rebecca or Ann Voskamp or Lisa Turkhurst or some of the other women who are voices to women about their role of faithfulness in this culture, come and be a part of Q Women where you're going to hear specific talks Focus right where you need to hear it most. And so we invite you to join us. You can learn more about all of this at qideas.org slash 2017. That's qideas.org slash 2017. And I can't wait to see you there. Well, thank you for being a part of this episode, and we look forward to talking to you again next week.